Thank you for joining us on another episode of Latter Gay Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Ashworth, and you are at the intersection of sexuality and reality, where it meets at LGBTQ Avenue and LDS Street. We thank you for giving us an hour of your time, and thank you for joining us on another excellent Latter Gay Stories episode. This is going to be a little bit different. You've probably seen the teasers. We want to welcome you. We want to welcome maybe a little bit different audience to the Latter Gay Stories podcast but we're excited to have you along. If you are listening on an audio version of the podcast, we invite you to uh, subscribe to this channel wherever you are listening. The Latter Gay Stories podcast is found everywhere you catch your favorite audio podcasts through Apple, Google, Stitcher, iTunes, uh, iHeartMedia, and all the others. We invite you to subscribe to this channel and leave us a rating as well. Doing that helps us expand uh, our reach and helps us build bigger and stronger bridges between the LDS and LGBTQ community, and more in particular, the marginalized communities among us. If you are watching on a video version, we also invite you to follow along in our live chat. We are broadcasting this episode on YouTube and Facebook, where there are uh, live stream live chats going on right now. We invite you to join into the conversation and uh, follow along. Let's find out what you think about this episode. If you have a question for our guests, you can feel uh, you're free to uh, include your comments, your messages, your thoughts in uh, the chat along this uh, podcast episode. So thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for uh, riding along. As you've seen, we are here with the Black Menaces, which if you are anywhere near uh, TikTok, you are well aware of this um, pretty incredible group of uh, young men and women who are at BYU. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for um, being on the podcast. And I want to, I want the audience to get to know you a little bit better. So they see the faces, they see the interviews, they see the discussions that are happening in real time, online, on social media channels, but who are the Black Menaces? And that's what I want to talk about today. How, does, how do the Black Menaces make a, a connection to Mormonism through LGBTQ people? Why is your number one most viral video on your TikTok channel uh, surrounding the topics of uh, LGBTQ Latter-day Saints and Mormonism? We want to talk a little bit about that. But first, I want to get to know you a little bit better. We'll start, well, first, I guess we should at least introduce. Um, we have Nate, Rachel, and Kylie from the Black Menaces. Welcome. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Happy to be here. Um, I want the audience to get to know you a little bit better. So first, let's start with you, Nate. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? Um, your relationship to the church and BYU. Uh, let the audience get to know Nate a little bit better. Absolutely. So before I do that, I just want to say that there are five Black Menaces altogether. Um, Sebastian and Kenethia were unable to be here today, but um, yeah, so there's five of us total. So the three of us and then Kenethia and Sebastian. Um, but my name is Nate. I just graduated from BYU with a degree in psychology. I am uh, looking to go into law school. I want to be an advocate um, for people who don't have a voice, right? You know, because obviously they need voices. And so this has been a great way to do that, but then I want to be able to further that um, into the law. Um, my relationship with the church has been interesting. Uh, I've always experienced racism and microaggressions, things like that, but I didn't always recognize that that's what it was. And so um, it's been interesting just kind of breaking down all of that, working through that. You know, I work with a therapist to kind of break down some of the things that happened in my past and like figure out where I stood with the church. And right now I'm still figuring that part out. Don't really know. Um, I just do know that I'm tired. So. Um, what other questions did you have for me? Oh, I like it so far. I, th I think that gives the audience a, a kind of a good overview of who you are and what did you, um, maybe, what did you graduate in? What was your degree in? Psychology. Okay, psychology. Mm -hmm. So you're understanding the human experience. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, interesting that BYU would give us a whole field of that, right? <laughs> <laughs> What about you, Rachel? Um, my name is Rachel. I am from Chicago. I am a sociology major at BYU, and I'll be finishing up the end of this summer, so I'm almost there. And um, I want to go into inclusion and equity and diversity for my career once I graduate. So again, like Nate, this is kind of something that I'm really passionate about career-wise, but also just in my life in general, and my family were converts to the church. I was still pretty young when my family converted. I was like eight, so um, 
almost nine, but I feel like that has been pretty integral in my experience in the church. And I feel like me, my relationship with the church right now is very much up in the air. I don't know what things are gonna look like in the future. I can't give any, everyone is always asking me and I can't give a solid answer because I don't know. I'm just trying to honor my feelings and honor what feels true and what makes me happy. And right now the church does not make me happy. It makes me feel stressed. I feel like I have to fight everywhere I turn and I don't want to feel that way at a place that's supposed to feel like refuge. That makes sense, thank you. Thank you for that. Now, um, I didn't mention, and maybe I should have, Nate, you're from Michigan. Um, Rachel, you're from Illinois. And Kylie, you, you are from Cali. <laughs> yes, California. We, we talked about that a little bit. <laughs> Rachel's from Chicago, not Illinois. Yes. She clarifies. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to say I get that. I didn't realize there was such a difference. Oh, yes. big difference. Because the rest of Illinois is actually pretty conservative and country but chicago is very liberal urban city see i hope to use this episode to learn far more things than i knew before we started <laughs> <laughs> we're already on a roll okay Good. what about you uh kylie tell us a little bit about yourself um well yes i'm kylie i am from california not cali most californians do not say cali but anyway um i'm a psychology major as well but i'm a junior so i have about a year ish left hopefully uh, I guess my relationship with the church is a little bit different. Um, I was raised in the church, but I actually attended with my grandparents. My mom is inactive and has been since forever, like eight years old, so basically her whole life. And then my dad actually is not a member, so I've always had the choice to go to church, which is kind of like, I guess, why my relationship is different. Um, I guess, like, to kind of elaborate on my relationship, it's the place where I think I understand my relationship with God the most. However, I do have my issues and problems with it, which is hard to kind of navigate. Um, so there is a lot of battles in my head, I guess, from time to time on how do I navigate feeling the strongest connection with God, but also issues with the church itself, not yeah, so we can dive into that later. But no, I like it, it make, and it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and it really helps us to understand why we're on a couch together, why we're having this conversation, and why, as um, you guys said in a in an interview not too long ago, um, why this becomes super uncomfortable in how the world um, was not fully prepared for what people at BYU actually go through yeah. and say and think all day mm -hmm. and and i think that's going to be an interesting part of this episode is just discussing what you're finding um on a byu campus uh in the heart of mormonism yeah. which is pretty fascinating but first um you have seven hundred thousand followers on tiktok mm -hmm. um your 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 videos have been viewed almost 25 million times mm -hmm. as we're recording this episode today I don't even know the total view. Those are just the likes on mm -hmm. your, your videos. I don't even know the total view count yeah. on, uh, you may have a, a better, but you're probably approaching a hundred million views um, on your, your videos, just on your TikTok channel, yeah. which is incredible. And Sebastian's not here to be the voice of one of the original or the idea behind yeah. um, the, the TikTok channel, but why Mormonism, why BYU, why, the black menaces, where, where, what's the genesis? Where did this come from? Well, I guess I get a firsthand talk into Sebastian, or view into Sebastian's head quite often, just because, mm -hmm. yeah. But I think for him, it was like, he's always kind of had issues with certain things, and Sebastian's really an advocate for a lot of people, just because, I mean, he's a male and he's 6'3", so he walks into a room and like, He's like, hey, so I'm going to stand up for everyone. And I think he had a lot of issues with how people were being treated, how he was being treated, how his sisters and just like his friends kind of like where Rachel and I were at that point, like, and he wanted to change things. And that's his whole goal. And we all kind of just were like, well, I want to change things too. So we all jumped in and created Black Menaces. I don't know. What do you guys think? I think yeah, I think the only thing I'd add is, as a marginalized student at BYU, we have experienced so much just being black, right? And we are friends with people from other marginalized backgrounds, identities, because of our blackness. 
And so we see this firsthand, not just with ourselves, but with our friends, like Kylie said, everyone that I know, for the most part, has some type of intersecting identity at BYU that yeah. makes their experience not the typical Mormon LDS experience at BYU. And so we just wanted to share that experience because it's difficult and people outside of Provo don't really know what that reality is like. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to kind of show what that's like for us, especially as black students, because that's what we experienced firsthand. What did that meeting look like when everybody, when you all got together and said, let's do it? What were, what were your thoughts, the brainstorm? Um, and maybe even, were there any risks? Did you look at this and say, this is not good for us as BYU students to shine light into some of Mormonism's darkest closets? Were those, any of those discussions had? I will say we didn't know that we were going to blow up the way that we did. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think that's why I laughed. Yeah. Like, you know, if you go back and look at our first video, it was a video re just reacting to Brad Wilcox's comments. Okay, got it. You know, he made some just every wrong thing that you could say Brad Wilcox said. And so we reacted to the things that he said about race. And um, yeah, people started following us and, you know, we just kind of blew up. So there's, there was never really a meeting like, oh, let's just, you know, let's get together and inform this. But it was just kind of, we just decided, hey, we're going to do something fun. We're going to let the world know how we feel. So we made our video and then we just started blowing up. And so we started asking, you know, other members of the Black Student Union, hey, how do you feel about this? Or what's your favorite thing, your least favorite thing about BYU? Um, and people just really attached themselves to that. And so it just kind of spread out to where we started asking BYU students what they thought, because we already know mm -hmm. that our experience and their experience is completely different. And so it just kind of um, was just like a natural, I don't know what you call it, a natural reaction to, to where we started. Someone commented and was like, now ask white students what they think. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's when we were like... Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's the best idea. Like, we didn't like, even think about that. <laughs> yeah, we were like, let's compare. Like, we yeah. wanted to do that. That's what was our main point of doing the video was to compare what a white student would say versus like a black student. And that kind of led us down the rabbit hole of continuing to ask BYU students what they thought about things. Because yeah. <laughs> we realized people really were exposing themselves to us. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. I, I like what you brought up, um, Brad Wilcox, because your TikTok channel started in February. Brad Wilcox gave his talk in February. And February is also Black History, Black History Month. Month. Yes. Yes. The even... most stressful month of the year, honestly, yes. which is so sad. Especially this one. I feel like this one was so chaotic. Well, I feel like every year, honestly, mm -hmm. since I've gone to BYU, every year there's been some large, whatever you want to consider large, racial incident. 2020, it was um, a panel where racist comments and questions were submitted mm -hmm. that were just not okay. Then this year it was uh, Brad Wilcox. What happened Before last that, year? It was blackface. Yeah, blackface. Oh, another something. year. Yeah. So there's always something going on. It's just like when is the hat gonna drop? More so, not if it will drop. Yeah. So for those who are not totally familiar with who Brad Wilcox is, who wants to be the sacrificial lamb and give us the uh, the rundown of what happened. That's the only date. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah, so Brad Wilcox is, uh, he's a higher up ecclesiastical leader in the church. Um, he's, uh, he's in the young men's general presidency for the entire church. Um, and he's also a professor at BYU. And basically he was giving a talk at a, a, a devotional in, I think, Alpine, oh, Utah or something like that. And he... He was talking about, you know, things that people say to him, you know, when they have questions about the church. And so he was like, oh, well, you know, people ask me, why didn't blacks get the priesthood until 1829, Brother Wilcox? What's up with that? And then he says, well, maybe the question we should be asking is, why didn't the whites get the priesthood until, what was it, 18? Whatever year. Yeah, why did they have to wait so long? Why did they have to wait 1,829 years? Right. And the blacks only had to wait 170-something, you know? Right. So... Um, you know, there are so many things wrong with that comment, um, doctrinally, scripturally, just common sense wise. And then also mm -hmm. it was just a racist thing to say. And so uh, we just felt like we needed to address it because it happened right smack at the beginning of Black History Month. Yeah. Did anybody try to reach out to Brad Wilcox for a clarification? Um, oh, anyone absolutely. In, per, I mean, personally or in your community that tried to say, hey, before the whole storm yeah. happened, before this turned into a Well, a this is the second time he's given... No, more than second oh, time. Second? This is... This is he is oh, known so for, like, rehearsing and having, like, rehearsed lines, which mm -hmm. people in the church in general are, which I have an issue with. 
part of my issues. But um, he's known for that. This is not the first time a previous black student, an alumni, Melody Jackson, he gave the exact same talk in her stake in 2017, and she tried to speak with him about it, and he just ignored her. So this is not the first time a black BYU student has confronted Brad Wilcox or has comments, actually. Yeah. And then we confronted him this time. The Black Student Union um, confronted him about it. We actually tried to go to one of his classes and sit in and have a discussion, something that we had done before with other professors. And he freaked out. He had security there because he thought that he was in danger for some reason. And so, um, you know, we ended up having a, a more private meeting with him, uh, you know, like a couple of weeks later. And me and Rachel were there. And, Along with Sebastian. Yeah, was Sebastian was also there. And then a couple other members of the Black Student Union. And, you know, it was, it was very performative. Okay. Very you know, performative. It was very performative. You know, Nothing he gave many apologies. Yeah, he gave many apologies in private. We said, well, we want these same apologies in public for all the people that don't understand um, why what you said was wrong. And he said, oh, well, I'll see what I can do. Nothing ever happened. We didn't really expect it to. We had hoped. But, um, you know, it was all very performative. The church is very willing to say things in private, do things in private or do things that make them look good, but when it comes mm -hmm. to actually doing the work to make things right, to make amends, it's very, very lacking there. Do you think, interestingly enough, do you think Brad Wilcox really saw the error in his message? Or was this, and, and I wanna tie this into where you're at a little further into your interviews, but is this an ingrained message where this is, continued indoctrination for so long that he just believes that maybe you just don't understand the history well enough because he's got years under his belt as opposed to you? Um, or do you think there was something genuinely triggered, I don't want to say triggered, uh, um, something genuine in Brad Wilcox's demeanor in those meetings or your experiences that he maybe said, yeah, I might have made a mistake and here's where I can do better. So Sorry I'm talking a lot, but I actually, I don't think that he's genuine. I think he was sorry that he was in that situation, mm -hmm. but as far as understanding why what he did was wrong, there's no, there's no remorse there. And I actually know that for a fact. I know someone who um, was in a room with Brad Wilcox as he was, you know, because he kind of went on like a little apology tour and was talking to a bunch of different people and, you know, kind of giving his written apology. Um, and I, I know someone who was in the room with him and they actually let me hear an, a recording of him talking about how he was persecuted and how he got a call from Elder Holland, uh, who and Elder Holland sympathized with him about how you know they were both persecuted like Paul. I think that was the words that they used. So he he's very much the victim in his mind, um, and so he was just sorry that he got exposed, really. But there's no remorse about what he said, or no understanding as to why that what he said was wrong. And I think he would probably do it again if he if he could get away with it. When you hear something like that as a marginalized community at BYU, he's been persecuted like Paul. <laughs> what does that tell you? What, what impressions do you get? I think for me, it's more just like, it just kind of shows that, see this is kind of where like my, I don't know what to call it, back and forthness goes. Whereas like the church is made for like we talk about this all the time, like the church is made for like middle class to rich white conservative men. And so like to say that they were persecuted, it's like, oh, welcome to every single day of our lives, like any marginalized community. And so like you take someone kind of like what you're saying, like Brad Wilcox, who knows a lot, like we won't take that from him, but some of that information that he knows might not be, most of it is not correct on like the history of things, but you can't taking that away, like trying to untrain him of those ideas is like Nate said, like he would do it again if he could get away with it. And I think that's why they make excuses because in their head, they have this like grand idea of who they think God is and how things are going to happen. But it's so far from wrong mm -hmm. that that's where the issue, I don't want to say issues, but the problems and like the heartache come from because we have an, our understanding of our relationship and how God loves us and then they have their own relationship and they're so concerned of like pushing a narrative of like oh no God loves you this way and it's like what makes you better than me because at the end of the day we all have our own sin and issues and whatnot yeah, I'm just saying, I don't know. I, I, I tell no. them, like, I'm a... and, and the only thing I'd add to that is it just shows their privilege <laughs> that they've never in their life have had it 
have had to feel that way in a church setting. And I think that's the issue is that church leaders are so out of touch with the reality of anyone who is not rich, white, and straight. Mm -hmm. You do not understand existing in the space of the LDS church. If you do not fall into that category, you are going to encounter culturally and doctrinally something that is going to make you feel uncomfortable and you have to figure out a way to move past that uncomfortable moment that um, doctrinal thing you find an issue with and figure out a way to make the church work for you or you have the conversation with you or you have an internal conflict like what Kylie is talking about and these leaders of the church such as Brad Wilcox, Elder Holland, I don't think they've ever had to do that. And if they have, they surely don't talk about it because they need to if they have, because that is what the reality is for queer people in the church. That is reality for black people, um, it, people even not from the United States who join the church, right? There's some degree of how do I reconcile this with my reality in life and my reality in this white European rich church. This has got to be super uh, delicate territory for the church to trot in, because uh, when you look at numbers in terms of church growth in the United States, in that very demographic that you just talked about, mm -hmm. Rachel, the white, straight, uh, rich communities, the church is losing membership. Mm -hmm. And in the areas that they're growing the very fastest are in the communities mm -hmm. where they marginalize the most. Yep. Africa, um, yep. the black countries where the, the members are joining. And so I wonder if this puts the church into a far more precarious and unique situation um, where they now have to face not only their history, but also this archaic indoctrination that people like Brad Wilcox carry around with them. And how does that happen? I mean, I think the church say like, is it safe face? Not the right word. Like, they, I will say they present very, very well. I mean, Rachel, you probably have better experience just being a convert, but like, I think the way they present to marginalized communities is like mm -hmm. a world of opportunity and love and like this loving Heavenly Father. And they are very good at giving you that, but then they leave out, oh, well, then there's this and then there's that. And like, I've heard a lot of, of my friends who are converts that, they didn't know about the priesthood ban and they didn't know that like they just didn't know all of these things with the history but now they're already members of the church and so i think that's where it happens is like if you're educated and white you have access to those resources but if you go to africa for example and like the church is just isn't as like developed there yet whereas like there's no you can't google like as easily or the book of mormon's not just right on the shelf down the street i think they just give you what you want to hear, and then they save the bad for later. Um, uh, oh, yeah. sorry. Uh, I, no, and I, you and I also think that leadership of the church is old and white. So even if the membership is changing and the demographics are changing in terms of like the church, who leads the church, who is going out to Africa to open stakes, who is going out to be branch presidents, are older, rich, white mm -hmm. men who have led the church in the indoctrinated way for such a long time. That's the main problem. Because I feel like the upcoming generation, Gen Z, is pretty aware of church issues and are talking about things in a different way. And even, um, I don't know, the generation, millennials, and what's the generation before that, Gen X, I don't know who they are. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> millennials and people before them who now are becoming bishops and such, and they're doing a better job about addressing those things and talking about them. But older people who end up are in charge of the church, right? The prophet, the 12 area authorities are older people who have not unlearned problematic doctrine about black people, about queer people, about anybody who's not rich and white or about women and these things. And so that's how these things become perpetual problems because they're still taught. A, a BYU professor was telling me how their son who was 10 years old in Spanish Fork was learning how black people are like lost the war in heaven, and that is why they did not get the priesthood. That's happening in Utah County in 2022, being taught by a 50 year old something lady teaching primary. That is how these things are continuing to exist in the church is because older people are not being corrected on false doctrine and the church really doesn't have a handle on that because they're the ones who taught it at a certain point. And now they disavow these things statement wise on their records, but it is not out of the culture and out of some people believe what is doctrine and why a Brad Wilcox can go up 
on a stand in his front of a stake and say something like that because he believes that's what he was taught. That's what he believes is true. And for me, it's problematic that even on a church level, like um, church leader level, there's no formal training. There's no, hey, this is now what we believe and teach. You're still letting people go out of pocket and say whatever they believe and teach their personal doctrine truly because you know, the church always falls back that they have printed statements that we do not believe this and we've disavowed X, Y, and Z. But there's no consequences. Like, okay, so for us, if we say, like right now, if we say something that's unaligned, we can get kicked out of school. Brad Wilcox is a professor and a whole leader and nothing happened. So it's like, here I am, so many years younger than Brad Wilcox, basically a child and hence comparison, and I get kicked out of school for making a mistake and there's, he gets a little tap on the wrist and a, oh, I'm sorry, and I reconcile with or you. Or let's hide I'm, you from speaking for a couple months. Yeah, so just so you don't mess up again. Like, how is that fair? Like, I'm learning, and he's supposed to be someone I can look up to and be a mentor in the church, but nothing happens to him? Like, how is... That's what just blows me away is that there's no consequences. I think it definitely should be a discussion about equity here because you do have a... Uh, you have a great point in the fact that you have a Brad Wilcox who can say these types of things and really hurt a marginalized community and not get any pushback from 50 North Temple, not get any pushback from the board, the board of trustees, the apostles, and, and the president of the church, president of BYU in particular. But that's not just a Brad Wilcox issue. We also have a Hank Smith who called uh, Calvin Burke a uh, core whore. Yeah. And so how, like... I missed that one. Oh, yeah, that was on Twitter. Oh. Was that 2020, 2020? That was 2021. 2021, yeah. Yeah, that was gone. So how do, we, how, do we, how do we address this fact that we have BYU professors who are marginalizing or they're degrading a marginalized community mm -hmm. and not facing any repercussion? Is that right? Well, <laughs> the reason they're not facing any repercussions is because the brethren agree with them. That's like they, they can't say it as publicly as they would have been able to say it before, but I mean they were they grew up during the McKay and Ezra Taft mm -hmm. Benson and Spencer W. Kimball. Like they grew up during that time period. They ingested all of those things and they still believe them with every fiber of their being. That's why they've been able to climb up the ladder to where they are now. Because it's all nepotism, right? It, but that's another discussion. And, um, oh sorry, I don't want to interrupt you. I don't know, so but um yeah, just to sum up, they all agree with those things. And the evidence we see of that, I still have my Come Follow Me manual from oh, a couple years ago, the this. Book of Mormon one. They actually printed in that book that uh, dark skin was a sign of the curse, but that it's not a, a sign of the curse anymore. All right. So the fact that they actually printed that out, that it made it through all the levels of church publication mm -hmm. and got printed was evidence to me that, okay, they still believe this. And that's why they approve this because, you know, they read all that stuff carefully. And then, of course, you know, once it came out and they got exposed for it, then they recalled it and it was all very hush hush. They recalled the books and then they changed the... They changed the, the online changed version, the online but the printed one. version they got sent mm -hmm. to countries like Africa. Yeah are still there. So it's still there. So I mean, they, they believe it, they just can't say it. And we talked about this off uh, cameras just a little bit about how um, we just joked when we were doing a mic test that uh, to recite the introduction to the Book of Mormon. And even the introduction to the Book of Mormon was changed. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was a missionary, there, well, there were copies of the Book of Mormon yeah. that said we, that the Lamanites are the principal ancestors of the American Indians. Mm -hmm. And now the church has changed that to say among the principal ancestors of the American Indians. So again, we have another discussion of marginalized individuals within the church that um, the church now has to kind of reel and, f and become a little more finicky and, and complex and precise in terms of how they deal with the way they've marginalized people again. And, and I also think a lot of this comes down to the way the church wants to be perceived. At the end of the day, the church will do whatever it takes to save their name and to save the way they look to the world. And I think they try to cover it up as best as they can without offending the rich tithe payers. I'm sorry, that's just what it is because they're so concerned because example with the Brow Wilcox thing when we met with him, when we, we requested another apology specifically addressing the black community and to address what he had said because his first apology was very generic, felt not genuine. And when we asked him to give this second apology, he was very apprehensive. I don't know if they'll let me, we don't know, blah, blah. And to me, when the church is so worried about the way that they're going to be perceived that they don't want to assist marginalized communities, 
to me, it looks like they care more about what the white rich people think in the church and they do about the poor, marginalized communities, um, number wise, right? Because I mean, although number wise people in the church is expanding to other places, the United States rich members are the ones who are keeping the church afloat financially. Let's keep it 100 here. But poor people from Africa are not the people keeping the church afloat, you know, like financially. And I think for me, it feels as though they care more about what those people think and how upset they will be. Like every general conference, you know, we're hoping that something is said um, an affirmation about queer people, about black people, about international people. We're hoping this, but it never happens because we know how many people would be upset if the prophet got up there and apologized for what they did to black people with the priesthood ban. How many people would be like, I'm never coming back to church. I'm not donating my money to that church anymore. The church, it feels for me as though they're more fearful of that than they are to help black people queer people to feel like they see them and they see the struggle they go through. I like that you opened that up with perception, like the perception is, because I look at you three who are all not from Utah, mm -hmm. who are all not part of the predominant race, mm -hmm. who coming, came into BYU uh, looking, acting, and knowing something a little different. I'm curious what your perception of BYU and Utah Mormonism was prior to attending the university. Oh now, we all, um, we all have very different understandings, so that's yeah. why it's funny. And we didn't even know some of our own perceptions mm -hmm. until we started doing interviews. Yeah. And I didn't like, know how y'all felt until I we did think interviews, so it's funny. One of the things I noticed my freshman year, probably like two months in, was like, you can tell what part of the United States a member of the church is from, Fact. from like, five basic questions and I think it's the funniest thing because it's like I don't know what it is about Utah that's probably why people on TikTok think it's not real because I don't know what happens here but I think like I work at a school it's like the kids I work with are like members and so it's so ingrained in like their teachings because their teachers are members of the church and like they're walking down the hall talking about Relief Society and I'm like why are y'all talking about this at school and like everything mm -hmm. here is just so like huh like it doesn't even make sense. And like at Cal in like in California, like I had friends who I went to school with who were members, but even my friends were so understanding and like we were in high school, so none of us wore garments, so we didn't always like dress modestly. And like there were certain like little things that are church standards, but like I could go to um, what was it even called? Like you know, a little Wednesday night mutual. Oh, yes. mutual, yeah. I could go to mutual in my shorts because it's a hundred degrees where I'm from, and my shorts that didn't go down to my knees, and no one cared, or I might have whatever at school and got in trouble, and nobody in my ward was like on me. Whereas like the school I work at, it's like the teachers will talk to the kids about church, and like mm -hmm. I'm like, why are we in this set? Everything here is so different. I don't even know how to elaborate. I'm talking a lot, but I think like. Everywhere we live, because we all kind of live in different areas, is so different on like the core things you would think are should be universal, but are so different. Like, I don't know what you guys are taught about like, I don't know, like I was talked about about blacks in the priesthood, but I don't think you guys were as a kid. I, I was. Um, yeah. My ward is really unique back mm -hmm. home. It's, I feel like people who are intellectuals in the church. Um, my award is where all the people who go to the University of Chicago end up. So they either stay in Chicago, um, got their PhDs there, whatever it may be. Um, and so I feel like I was pretty aware of what I was walking into. Also, I'm, I'm so anxious that I don't go into spaces without like doing a ton of research and knowing what I'm stepping into. So previously I had gone to EFY, I had gone to church out here with like people who had moved away from my home ward and um, live out here. Um, I had watched like Janisha, who was a previous black student at BYU, made these videos about like the black experience at BYU on YouTube. They're like a couple years old. You can go and find them. We and I, we are no, not those. Before that, okay. she made other videos. So, and I was, I was anything I could get about the demographics of BYU, black people at BYU. I read it, I saw it, I knew it, and I was very aware of the racial situation I was walking in. I was aware I would be a super minority when I came to BYU. And um, especially going to EFY, that was pretty indicative of what my experience would be like at BYU. And in my head, I thought that it, um, I knew it was gonna be difficult, but I had this hope that because I was with people amongst my same faith, because my home stake, I had so many friends, people who were members of people who I felt like were really chill and awesome. Half my stake is Spanish speaking, by the way. So I have friends from 
um, who were part of the Spanish ward or part of the English wards. And so I had hoped that I would find people like that when I came to BYU, even though I knew racially I would be such a minority, which I wasn't used to because white people are the minority in my youth, in my stake, and even in the youth in my home ward, most of the people are still African American. Um, the older people are, it's still majority white, but youth wise, white people are the minority. So I had a very different experience and I was hoping that I could find some type of community when I came here, but I still knew that I was gonna be a very small percentage of the population. Maybe, go ahead. Uh, for me, my perception of the church was, it was very different. So I, you know, I grew up in, in Michigan, um, you know, there was a pretty decent amount of members there, but it was not diverse, right? So it was mostly uh, white people. Every ward that I grew up in, I was always the only, you know, one of the only white kids, me and my siblings, I'm sorry, not white, um, me and my, <laughs> it is <laughs> me, and my siblings, <laughs> me and my siblings were some of the, you know, we were always the only black kids in the ward. Um, and our family was usually the only black family. And so um, I just was kind of used to that. But, you know, at home, uh, my, my family's, you know, my parents have always been very, very black because they're both from the South. They grew up Baptist and, you know, they joined the church. And so I kind of had like these two different worlds that I was navigating, um, learning how to code switch and whatnot. Um, and it was always, I don't know, I, I never had any issues with the church growing up because all of that stuff was kind of hidden from me, right? It was always just very much, you know, go to primary, go to Sunday school, go to sacrament meeting and, you know, everything is wonderful and, and happy-go-lucky. Um, and then when I was like nine years old, a uh, little girl in my Valiant 9 class asked if um, I would be white when I went to heaven. And I was still too young to really understand what that meant, but I just do remember thinking it was weird, like, why would I need to be white? You know, why does that matter? Um, and then, you know, moving forward, the only time I ever heard about the priesthood ban was when I uh, was in seminary and they brushed over it really fast. I just kind of remember it was a little bit tense, but I was, again, too young to really understand what that meant. And it was just kind of brushed over, like, oh, black people couldn't have the priesthood. But then they let them have the priesthood, it's all good, right? It's it just moving on. And so, um, you know, I didn't really have a chance to really address any of those things. And it was also something that my parents never talked about. I'm not sure if it was because they didn't know or if they just didn't want to, to address those, you know, at a younger age. I kind of wish that they had. But then getting to BYU, I remember getting out here and thinking that it was going to be this wonderful place where I fit in with everybody, where everybody thought the same ways that I did. And then I got here and I just remember feeling incredibly lonely. You know, I called my parents after being here for a couple months and I was like, man, I don't fit in. Like these people don't have the same standards that I do. Um, my roommate is sneaking out to the girls dorm every single, you know, every single night. And I was like, man, this is not what I thought BYU was supposed to be. I thought everybody here was, you know, holy, so to speak. Um, and so, um, I, you know, I, I thought that BYU was going to be this perfect place where everybody was a, a good, you know, little Christian Mormon child or what have you. And uh, it wasn't that at all. And so um, it was very disillusioning, I suppose, would be the, word, the right way to say it. And then going on my mission even more so because then I had to live in close contact with people that I had no desire to live with, um, work with people that had, you know, that had grown up in Utah, grown up in the church. And I'm like, man, you spent 18 years in this and you still don't even know like, how to find First Nephi, you know, so... Um, all of those things just combined have really made me quite a cynic uh, when it comes to um, people in the church. Right? And I still believe that the, the essential principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ are correct, but as far as man-made doctrines, um, the people in the church, I'm extremely cynical and mistrusting of, of anybody in the church. And so, um, yeah, my perception has definitely evolved over time. I, I think you bring up a really great point that I hadn't really thought of prior to this interview, and that is the reaction of your parents. So you reached out, Nate, to your parents, uh, letting them know how you felt um, in terms of assimilation into BYU. But with the viral fame of the Black Menaces, I wonder, and the question is, what are your parents' reaction now? Um, did they send their kids to BYU, and now you've stirred BYU up so much? Is that now an embarrassment? Are they proud of, of what you're able to accomplish in terms of your advocacy? Or have you had this discussion with your parents at all yet? Um, okay, so just a backstory. I'm biracial, so my mom is white, and that's why, I, like I said, I go to church with my grandparents back home. Um, so when this first started, 
My grandma was a little confused of the purpose. Um, which, like, whatever, I understand, I guess, kind of, like, where she was coming from, but she did kind of, like, come at me in a way that my grandma normally doesn't talk to me, which was, like, I was, like, oh, like, excuse me, like, that was really, like, weird, and so I did kind of have to, so the way my, like, relationship with my mom and my grandma works, like, we're all super close, so then I called my mom, and I was, like, why is grandma talking to me like this, like, I'm, I don't understand so then I explained to my, because my mom is like, she'll take a more of a backseat approach on things. So she was like, well, explain it to me. So after I explained it to my mom, she was like, oh, okay, give me a second. So then she called my grandma and was like, don't come at my daughter. Like, da, 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 da. Here's what's happening. Like, let me explain it to you. Um, so then like some time went by and they didn't say anything. And then I just kind of, I, one thing I've like done with my family is like, I just keep talking about things, no matter how uncomfortable it makes them feel. And I make my mom listen to me and I make my grandma listen to me. My mom is more better, like she's better at receiving things than my grandma because she's older and obviously and whatever. Um, and then like out of nowhere, my mom posted something on Facebook of like, I'm so proud of Kylie for like using her voice. And like for me, that really was like, oh, like it kind of made me tear up because just knowing that my mom after like between my freshman year at BYU and like now of like, she has been listening to me and it might have taken her a second to fully understand which is fine because she's white and doesn't she'll never go through the same things as me um but knowing that like she listens and she supports me even if it did take a second and even like my grandma ended up reaching out to me and apologizing and she's like i'm sorry that i didn't understand and like that's all we ask for i mean even with our leaders like we understand that there's some things that we can't go back and change like racism and slavery like all of those things were things and like some of them still are but if we acknowledge the mistakes and that's okay and for me my family did that and because they've always loved me and supported me and it just takes a second and I can respect that if you acknowledge me so yeah my my aim was kind of been like this uh. but now we're on the same page of they support and they're strong advocates for what we do my family is super supportive yeah. they my mom's a convert and I feel like she doesn't understand certain things in a certain way like sometimes we kind of get into like where I'm at with things in the church she doesn't fully understand but because my mom has only gone to church in Chicago and my home ward which it does good in a lot of ways um, it's still issues and things that they can work on definitely but she hasn't experienced Utah Mormonism and hasn't really seen the church at the to me I'm at this point of um institutionally I have issues with things and my mom she doesn't really understand that sometimes but she's super proud of what I do because you know black people have been fighting for years and in every space they go in and so my mom my grandma my siblings everybody is like yep that's what needs to happen and if anyone was going to do it it was going to be me um yeah and so they they're super happy very supportive my mom has no bad things if anything she's like posting on facebook about me and she gets funny things she came, she came for graduation this was so funny she came for graduation um a couple weeks ago and she was at the bookstore and she was my mom's always trying to get a discount everywhere she goes and she was like my daughter is one of the black menaces so i should get a discount or something and i'm like mom some people might not like that i'm a part of the black menaces and so she was like yeah that's my daughter give me a discount on this stuff and so she's super proud of what i'm doing so i think that's kind of funny she thought she was gonna get a discount awesome. but what about you nate your family oh man i'm not even sure my parents really know what i'm doing they're very anti-social media um, so I wasn't, you know, I wasn't allowed to have social media growing up. And then I got to college and I got a Facebook and my dad was like, delete your Facebook. So I deleted it. And then I started up again. He's like, delete your Facebook. And so I deleted it, started up again, like, delete your Facebook. And I was like, no, I'm not. I'm going to use this. Right. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I've, I've had to kind of learn how to use um, social media to my advantage and as a tool. And then, you know, I, I don't really talk with my dad anymore. Um, but, you know, as far as my mom, I've told her a little bit about what we're doing, but I don't think she understands the scale on which we're doing things. Mm -hmm. And then also, I haven't really broached a lot of the subjects that we talk about with her. Um, she knows that we have some differences in opinion. My parents are very conservative. Um, and, and um, you know, she knows that there's some difference of opinion there. But we haven't really addressed those differences just because... Um, you know, my parents are very, very stubborn when it comes to certain things and very, very biblical 
very doctrinal and so trying to broach certain subjects is just it's almost more trouble than it's worth eventually i'm going to need to have that that difficult conversation otherwise i'm a hypocrite right but um uh, you know, I have other family that is very supportive, like my sisters um, love what I'm doing. Um, I you know, was talking to my aunt the other day, and she's like, oh, I saw your videos on, on Instagram. And I was like, oh, really? She's like, yeah, I love what you're doing. Right? So, you know, I've got a uh, different family that's supportive and understands what's going on. Um, I want to talk, let's talk about the social media, because that's the crux of what you are, are doing. And um, 700,000 followers on TikTok. Mm-hmm. 25 million with an M likes, um, unbelievable. One of the most, um, well, it is your most viral TikTok, and we're not just on TikTok. Your, your videos are being shared on Facebook, on Instagram, mm-hmm. on all the socials. Um, but one of your most viral videos is a, is a collection of videos. Now, some, this may surprise you, but some from our audience may have never seen a Black Menace video. Um, so uh, we'll play a few throughout this episode to bring our audience up to speed. Um, but one of the most viral on your TikTok channel is one where you asked about gay marriage at BYU. And that's kind of the method of the Black Menaces. You approach people on campus and ask them about social justice topics, essentially. Um, topics of marginaliz- marginalization, topics of... Oh, areas where most Latter-day Saints are probably a little weak in their historical knowledge and background. Um, but why the LGBTQ topic? Why do you think that particular video, knowing that your channel, um, your platform was created around the Brad Wilcox debacle, <laughs> why is it that your number one video had to deal with uh, the LGBTQ community? Why is it gay marriage that shot your, uh, your platform through the roof? Like, mm-hmm. like literally a yeah. Tesla rocket? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh. I, th- I, can, yeah, yeah, uh, okay. I think it's, apart from like the black community, I think the LGBT community has been another marginalized community in the church that has faced some of the most backlash, I think. And um, kind of like we were talking off camera, like I have an uncle who's gay and he's my great uncle. So he's born in like the fifties. And so he, this is something like from like, he's faced issues his whole life, like being raised in the church mm-hmm. and having this, like, well, like, I don't know, does this, and does God love me? And can I do these things? And so I think it kind of brought light to a lot of different age groups, people who are older, who are part of the community, people who are younger and I mean, people are our age now, like at some point, I think we all fall into the LGBT community because we're either allies or we're bisexual or we're this or we're that, whatever. And so it's like, I think it just brought light to like, here we are on a conservative campus. And like, there's people in our video who are like, well, I'm bisexual. So like, this, this is great. Like, and I think it just kind of like, I think it was more like a joyful moment, but then also it brought a lot of like, oh, like we need to talk about this. So I think that's why it blew up because it reached so many different people. Yeah, and oh, I we kind of wanted to cover. I feel like our um, TikTok has kind of evolved, and our purpose mm-hmm. had evolved as we've had the TikTok. Because like Nate said earlier, we did not anticipate this growth, and so we kind of felt our responsibility as our videos gained popularity, not just to highlight the reality of Black people, but like I said, the reality of all marginalized communities at BYU. And so we knew that we wanted to cover issues um, with queer students because we are all allies to the community. And also, I think that video in particular, there are a lot of racial issues in the church, but there's also racial issues in the world, right, that people are trying to work towards. And I feel like people know that that's wrong. Like blatant racism, we are moving past that day where people know they can say the N-word and black people are less than, and those things are no-nos and people know that. But in the church in particular, people still still feel like they can have homophobic views because of the doctrine of the church. And I feel like that's the most jarring part about BYU and about the church and why that video was so, because I feel like outside the church, people also, I mean, I think the world is moving to know that homophobic views aren't okay. We're slowly getting there. There's still problems, still improvement. But within the church, there's, the meter is not being moved very far, in my opinion, because 
it's like, well, we love them, but we don't support what they do. And so people feel emboldened and they feel like they have doctrine, church leaders, church lessons, everything backing their view of not supporting gay marriage. And we ask that particular question because we know people are the whole, we love them, love them, not the sin, and we support you, just not what you're doing type thing. And so we wanted to get at the root of people in the church think, still think in 2022 that, that, that they don't need to support gay marriage. Christian views. In Christian, Even like Christian outside people outside church. the church, yeah. But exactly true. what you're saying, like, Black yeah. people, like people are like, the racism thing is kind of like, oh, okay, like we know that's wrong. But people still say like off the wall things about the LGBTQ community, like, and they get away with it because it's, it's like- in the Bible. Yeah. In the Bible it says that they're holding on to that Old Testament verse so strong, but not any of the other Old Testament verses, anywho, but yeah. you know, and so I think that that's really why. And it was so popular because amongst the people who are on TikTok, Gen Z, Gen Z is very accepting, very understanding. So being at an institution, seeing that multiple people at an institution believe this so firmly, and they didn't think anything wrong with it, right? Um, I think that was very shocking to Gen Z. Now, Nate, um, you were involved in in the viral TikTok one, the one I were kind of discussing mm -hmm. about gay marriage. Uh, you are involved in a number of interviews, and we'll play it for the audience um, now. But I want to, on the backside of this, I want to get your reaction. Um, not only a, a few from young people and old man, as you call them. <laughs> Sebastian. He is the one. Sebastian is the one. I'll be listening. Like, let's ask this old man. I'm like, I'm not asking the old white man nothing. He scares me. <laughs> but in the, I love when he always puts. BYU students and an old, old man, man. <laughs> or a, a professor. Like, that I love how you call that one it's specific Sebastian. person. It's Sebastian. It was a minutes activity. Yeah, yeah. literally yeah. Sebastian's the one, but go on, sorry. No, so on the, on the back side, after, I want to play it so the audience gets a, a chance to hear uh, and, and see uh, this particular TikTok that you made, this particular video. And But on the back side, I want to see or have you uh, tell us a little bit about the outtakes, what we didn't get to see oh. um, in that particular discussion. So here we go. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, uh, we'll let you watch it. And here are the black menaces on the BYU campus with the question, uh, is gay marriage approvable or would you uh, approve gay marriage? Do you support gay marriage? Yeah. 100%. Perfect. That's it? No. Okay. Cool. That's it? Yeah. 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 I'd say so. Okay. Yeah. Sweet. Um, I wouldn't say that I like encourage it, but I definitely don't judge people who do or who like are in gay marriages. Yes. Yeah. Someone wants to do that. Perfect, thank you. <laughs> um, personally, no. Um, I don't, I don't, I understand like the view of gay marriage. And uh, no. Okay. Marriage. Absolutely. Cool, look at that. All right, Nate, you heard that. Um, you, you were there as part of the, the filming of it. What reactions didn't we get to see uh, in the video? And, and maybe what were your gut reactions to, to those responses to that question? Oh man, so for the, for the first video that we filmed, I mean, we put in all of the, the, the interviews that we did. There were none that we left out because we wanted people to see. I mean, the same thing when we asked people if queer students should be allowed to date, um, when we asked about trans rights, all those kinds of things. We put all those interviews in, even though they were kind of tough to watch. Um, but I guess the part that you didn't get to see was our reactions. You know, it's a, uh, you know, after people give our answers, we just kind of look at each other and be like, wow, dude, this is gold, you know, because <laughs> <laughs> we know what to expect, right? We've lived it for so long that um, it, it just feels satisfying to finally get it on video. And it's incredible how Sebastian always says people are just bold. They'll just say whatever. They'll expose themselves willingly on camera and just, you know, put all of their views out there because they think that, you know, because of what the church teaches, um, because of what they've grown up believing, that it's just okay to believe those things. And, you know, everyone's entitled to their beliefs and opinions and whatnot. However, when they're wrong, they're wrong, right? It doesn't matter, you know, how you feel about it. Some things are just wrong. Some things are just right. Um, and so, you know, as far as, as really, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't have opinions about what other people are doing in their lives, right? It's up to them. It's up to them to decide. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, we just... Our reactions have always just kind of been, man, this is, I'm glad that we're finally getting this out there. Um, but yeah, aside from that, you know, just the occasional side look, side eye, chuckle, what have you, you know. That's one thing that I actually appreciate a lot, um, that we don't get much of your reactions in the actual videos that you're creating. 
but uh, this is my microphone, my platform. So I do want to pick your brains a little bit and just say, hey, like, have there been some episodes, some interviews that you're like, sh just shocked, like, just floored, like unbelievable. And would you want to share some of those? Um, when you look at your own student body at BYU and say, God help us, like literally. Any of those experiences? Well, you got one. The one that popped into my head instantly. Mm -hmm. The yeah. white, we, when we asked about white privilege, this, the, the, we like, okay, like, is white privilege real? Yes. And then it's like, do you have white privilege? No. And I, I was baffled. And see, I'm the nice one. So this I'm standing true. there like this, shaking my little head. And someone asked me, I think one of our friends was like, how do you just like, yeah. And I was like, I think I have to, I kind of separate myself where I like in my head, I'm like, what are you saying? And like, I want to go off and I want to scream and yell because it, it just hurts, I think, internally. But then at the same time, you're just like, I expected nothing less, which is awful to say in some situations. And, you know, judge books by the cover, but sometimes we do whatever. And so you have to, I think for me, I kind of just like, I turn around and I'm like, guys, why'd you make me ask that question? Like, I can't say anything. Whereas like Rachel's more expressive facially where she might look at you <laughs> funny, but I, I try really hard to just kind of, mm -hmm, and I just shake my head. But there's times where you're like, okay, you're done. Yeah. <laughs> and then we're moving on, <laughs> but we can't obviously. And that's not what we want to do because we want to show what happens, which is why we don't express our feelings. Mm -hmm. Rachel has um, some good ones. Though. Yeah, I think my feelings and reactions to most videos are like, I'm not surprised because BYU students are out of pocket in so many ways. And um, I think I shared this in an interview before, the most shocking was when we asked people if the priesthood ban came from God and a guy said, my, my initial reaction is yes. Your initial response is to say, yes, God would not want me because I am black to not enter the temple to make covenants that you believe are essential to exaltation. Read that back to yourself again, right? Like make literally, I'm like, did you think about what you said? Like make that seep into your body as a follower of Christ and let me know how that makes sense. And I think, um, and even, yeah, just different videos that we've done or even um, when we ask people about the gay marriage one, just realizing, because I think I associate with a lot of people who are pretty liberal, more open-minded at BYU. I always tell people, I don't associate with the general population, so I don't feel like I have a typical BYU experience. Um, and just hearing that and realizing that so many people on the student body think that way, so many people that go to my university do not believe that certain groups of people should have access to certain rights because they think whatever or they don't think they have white privilege. Um, I think for me, it's just, it's very sad because I very much push, put myself in a corner and push myself away from those experiences so that I can be safe at BYU. Um, but be, being reminded that that's the reality outside of the safe community and network I've created for myself, it's very disheartening. And it, I lose faith in the future of the church when I'm reminded of that. They're so bold. That's the problem. It's like, they'll look at you and like not even see, they're like, black lives don't matter. It's and like, you're I'm looking black. at a black life. Like, I'm confused. Like the well, one we you asked. You can even tell when they d they're uncomfortable. Yes, That's my favorite part, I think, actually, <laughs> is the physical discomfort you can feel from the person you're interviewing, mm -hmm. especially when there are questions about black people and I'm black and they're looking at me and you can feel the discomfort that they're feeling they're and like, that they're working through things and you, because to me, I'm like, I know what you're, if your response is not immediately yes and there's no discomfort, it's no. And you're trying to figure out a way to spit it out that sounds socially acceptable. If a white man mixes his blood with the African race, the penalty is death on the spot. Now, who said that, Brigham Young or KKK Grand Wizard David Duke? Uh, it was probably Brigham Young, huh? It was Brigham Young. <laughs> Dang. Thoughts? Uh, it's obviously a pretty bad quote, you know, because it makes him look like a fool because it's such a, you know, it's like, I don't even remember what you said, but he said he should be killed on the spot or something like that. Yeah, it's just like, it can reveal so much about someone like, like, 
their bigotry or their um it's like their inherent beliefs just like so just say something like that so my thoughts are it really brings down his overall character i would say um it could be either a Honestly, I could see Brigham Young saying it. Okay, so final answer? We'll go with Brigham Young. You are correct, unfortunately. Yeah. Thoughts? I mean, yeah, it sucks that a prophet would say something like that. Sure does. But, I mean, yeah, yeah, it sucks. <laughs> yeah, cool. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. It's got to be Brigham Young, right? You are correct. It was Brigham Young. Yeah, probably, yeah. probably Brigham Young. That is correct. Brigham Young said that. Is. On that quote? Um, our church leaders probably shouldn't say racist things. And we should be loving to everyone. Amen yep. to that. Yeah, they, they've done that a lot, and so it's kind of sad to listen about it. Perfect. Thank you. But then you have those ones who don't even care. Yes, And right. so that's even, so, I don't even know what's even worse, more, honestly. I think it's worse if you, bad. like, yeah. kind of try to trickle around it because then it's like, Whatever, I don't care. Like, whatever you believe in, that's fine, but say it with your chest. Like, if you're going to be homophobic and racist, that's fine, but say it to me. And I think that's the issue is, like, they're like, ah, well, uh, like, just say it because that's what you believe in. And if you're going to believe in something, be 100% about it. And I feel like if you're going around it, then you know it's wrong. And they don't process that, which is beyond And me. I think that's the, the most bold part about black menaces is I think people know racial things, like I said, are bad, are not okay. And I feel like as we've been asking more and we've gained popularity, people have been a little better with their responses. But with issues dealing with the LGBTQ plus community, it stays consistent because, again, people do not think there's anything wrong with what they are saying because they are part of the church and the church especially after general conference, when you guys did the part two about asking people if they supported gay marriage, people felt emboldened after the words of hearing church leaders affirm these things, what they believe, and they're saying things like a family proclamation and X, Y, Z. They feel like they have backing to believe problematically. I'm going to believe what church leaders say. So I think that that's extremely interesting. Something to look at over our videos is the reaction to things about dealing with the queer community are the same. Yeah. Okay, so the question is, do you support gay marriage? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. I support what is written in the family proclamation and what the leaders of the church say, and I will leave it at that. It, can you can you expound what what like what that is? Kind of like for people that don't know what that is, could you expound on what uh, that says? Exactly? Okay, the family proclamation is that uh, marriage is between one man and one woman um, for the purpose of um, rearing children. And that is what we as uh, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints believe in. And that is what um, we promote and defend. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Sweet. Thank you, man. What's your... Uh, not in general, no. Do you want to elaborate on that? I just, um, I mean, it's definitely a state-by-state -state issue. But I think that, um, if I can collect my thoughts, when something becomes supported by the state, then I think it can, it transfers the uh, it, it kind of sim sorry I'm a little on the spot here um, when the state says something's okay then the people who are governed begin to think it's more all right um, and I w wouldn't condemn any any gay people for anything at all but I, I just don't think that if I was voting I wouldn't vote in favor of gay marriage Perfect, thank you. Okay. Yep. I'd vote against it. Vote against it? Uh, yeah, same with me. Can I ask y'all why? I believe in a marriage with, between a man and a woman. Gotcha, gotcha. What about you? Same. Same? Okay, cool. So the question is, would you ever date a bisexual person? I think I will. Yeah, totally. I, well, actually, I have. Ah. Yeah. Love that. Love cool. that. I am actually gay, so yes. <laughs> <laughs> like a dog. Yeah. Yeah. Good. I don't know. It, uh, yeah. I mean, it, it depends, if, like. If they're a good person. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if they're. 
nice and that doesn't define who they are yeah mm, yeah cool that's it nope oh. i'm bisexual so of course i will oh, really? absolutely yeah cool that's it uh yes good i was reading uh your the comment section oh yeah and I shouldn't do that. I, no, you should, I love the comment section. That's my favorite part of the videos. If you if you want nice comments, go to TikTok. If you want all the evil people, you go to Instagram. Yeah, the people on Instagram, they're coming for throats. Oh, yeah. So mean. <laughs> Which I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I didn't. Well, and, and I have a... I mean, this goes right down the similar vein, just listening to that discussion. I was reading someone's comment who said, uh, what Mormonism, what the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints really needs mm -hmm. um, are more Gladys Knights and Alex Boyes and fewer Sisters in Zion and Black Menaces. That's I'm funny. curious what your reaction to comments like that are. Are you a threat to Mormonism? Are you a threat to, um, to <laughs> marginalized communities because of what you're doing? We're a threat to traditionalism, mm -hmm. is what we are. We're, we're, um, we're challenging traditions, because a lot of the things that people believe aren't even necessarily doctrinally sound. They're just traditions that have been passed on, um, and we challenge those things. And, you know, it's kind of like what Rachel and Kylie were talking about earlier, how when people just get uncomfortable, you know, you ask them the question on, on camera, and it's like you can hear their butt cheeks clench, right, because they're just... <laughs> so uncomfortable um i think that's that's what people are upset about they'd much rather be around people who make them feel comfortable and i know alex boyer pretty well and i've i've i sung in the choir with gladys knight for the b1 event that was a couple of years ago so i've had the chance to interact with both of them and they're great people um, but they also have a way of making white people comfortable around them and just kind of navigating that in a little bit of a different way um i've heard that like once you pass 30 you just kind of like you don't want to fight anymore but yeah. I, um you know, I think that there's a time and a place for that, but our whole goal is to make people uncomfortable and to challenge those kinds of ideas. Um, so basically what that person was saying was that they want more people, who are more marginalized people who are willing to make them feel good about themselves mm -hmm. as opposed to having people who will make them feel uncomfortable. And Sisters in Zion and the Black Menaces are much more about making you feel uncomfortable and challenging um, false narratives that you may believe than you know just existing right gladys knight alex boyer are wonderful people um, but they exist in the church as themselves and they're not um doing a lot to like actively challenge some of those ideas right they are just existing as, as who they are and being themselves and being um you know being wonderful in that way but they're not you know doing the same thing that we are if that makes sense i hope that doesn't sound shady or anything like that but no, oh, I, I actually think that's super honest, and I think you're you're dead on, and that's the problem that we face with the LGBTQ community as well. Is we're we're battling tradition, and so much of what's been spoken of with the queer community is tradition only, and it's just been rhetoric that has been passed along uh, through generations. And when you really nail people down, um, sometimes the only way of getting through to help someone understand the LGBT, LGBTQ Q, LGBTQ experience mm -hmm. is to literally use Mormonism against Mormonism. Yep. And, and I think that's a similar thread. That's what I see with the black menaces is using Mormonism against Mormonism to help teach a principle. Mm -hmm. And we need more of that from Gladys Knight and from Alex Boyer mm -hmm. and from uh, every single member of the church, regardless of their skin color, their origin, their sexuality. We need more honest discussions about the lived experiences of each of us. I was gonna say, like, not everyone has to be, not everyone's a, I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna be the face. And so, like, they could be doing things that we just don't necessarily see all over the media. And I think that's what people forget is, like, there's the people who are the front line, and then there's people on the back who are the brains and, like, the, what would you call it? You know what I'm saying? Like, n not everyone's fighting, like, in, in the, the front, same, yeah. and that's okay. And we're fighting different fights, too. There are yeah. lots of different things that need to be tackled. As we uh, kind of widen the podcast, I want to get your ideas about how to make Mormonism better. Now, obviously, you're exposing some of the skeletons in the closet, mm -hmm. and you're helping people feel uncomfortable. And hopefully, I would think that that leads some people to um, look deeper into their understanding of, of civil rights, of, of inclusion and kindness and demarginalization in communities. 
But what can church leaders do? And maybe we go from, let's attack this at 50 North Temple. Uh, what can Latter-day church leaders do um, to better understand the marginalized experience? And what small, simple things through your interactions with people on the streets could be used as messages to 50 North Temple to say, hey, if you just changed one or two areas, these specific topics, we could have a completely different landscape in Mormonism. Any thoughts or ideas there? It'd be nice if some of them started thinking about retirement, but obviously that's not an option. Um, but really, <laughs> that's... <laughs> if we're being honest, my was so different. Right, they're the ones that are, I mean, if we're being honest, they're the ones that are True. perpetuating these ideas. Yeah. And we need people who are willing to not perpetuate those things, right? Because they're, they're keeping it alive. Um, because it's not us. We're not the ones keeping it alive. Our generation is not um, perpetuating these ideas. And we're certainly not teaching ourselves these ideas. Um, but you know, as far as things that they can do, uh, it'd be nice if they would listen to us. We've been trying to meet with them for quite a while. Not the black ministers, but you know the BYU Black Student Union and things like that. Um, I was president of the Black Student Union at BYU. And uh, you know I, I tried for a very long time to meet with the president of the university and I was finally able to. I tried to meet with general authorities. Um, and it's just very hard to get into those spaces. And I think that the people that they are talking to are people who will make them feel comfortable. And we kind of saw that in Brad Wilcox's video apology, where um, when he talked about his dear friends that were educating him, it switched to the random black guy and then right back to him. Um, you know, so there's a few people in those circles that are, are telling them what they want to hear, I think. And um, they need to talk to people who are going to be honest with them about how they're actually feeling. And then when they hear those accounts, they need to do something about them. I think that's the thing too, is that they'll hear these stories and then they won't act on them or do anything to change them. Um, and so I think that, you know, if, they, if they're really looking to change things and they need to hear us and listen to us and hearken and do. Well, I think you brought that back around. <laughs> just a little. Just, I just was just little. gonna say, like acknowledge us as children of God and like, because that's what we, pr like the church preaches. And so I think a lot of like the marginalized communities, like it's like love one another and love thy neighbor, but it's not, it's like your white neighbor or your black neighbor that makes you feel good about yourself, not your gay neighbor or the black neighbor who's like super radical or like any of those. And it's like, we say love everyone, but we, the church doesn't do that. It's like we don't acknowledge everyone as like a child of God or like we extend grace to Brad Wilcox and the white people who make mistakes, but the black people or the LGBT people, like who make mistakes, like we don't extend grace to them or we don't try to understand and try to step out. Like we are so quick to judge and say like, I'm better than, and I'm this, or you're not going here because of how you choose to live your life. And I think that's, if they can understand that and start apologizing and recognizing the mistakes of the past, which is why they are the past, but we have to, we have to fix the past in order to continue to move forward. And we don't do that. Yeah. I think throughout this interview, I've been taken back to a lot of feelings and emotions that I really hadn't thought about in a while, just because most of our interviews are very focused on like black menaces, but we've been getting into Mormonism a lot. And um, it's just very heavy for me personally, because there's so many emotions tied up and I've had a lot of positive experiences in the church. Um, like I love my mission. I served a mission for the church, loved it. I love the people I met. And I feel like I really got to know more about Jesus. Um, but I also got to know, I remember on my mission, when I really understood the doctrine of the church, cause I feel like I didn't really know the doctrine because my family were converts. Um, but when I really understood how important covenants and ordinances were in the temple and the reality that like I wouldn't have been able to be there on my mission because you you know you have to be endowed to serve a mission and the reality that within my mother's lifetime that wouldn't have been an option for her or that wouldn't have been available to me um, because of the color of my skin that's when I feel like I really started to realize that it's deeper than just oh someone says something offensive to me at church like institutionally, the church needs to change things and that starts from the top down. I've always said that, I will always say that because I feel like I do meet a lot of people 
right now in the church who are trying to have things change. They're individuals, individual bishops, individual Relief Society presidents, individual members in these wards and stakes and branches who are trying to do better, but that can only go so far because from the top down, nothing is changing. And so my recommendation, if I could look President Nelson in the face right now, would say the church needs to apologize for what they did to black people for how many years. The church needs to acknowledge, like Kylie said, their racism. The church will never be able to fully repent and move forward like they tell all of us to do in our lives if they do not recognize what they have done. You cannot make restitution without recognition and there has been no recognition on the church's part. And if we... Asking for forgiveness. Yes. 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 Come on, let's take it back to the pamphlets uh, like that we can't. hand people when we're teaching. Let's hand it to you, President Nelson. Let's hand it to the rest of the 12. And remember, that is how you repent. That is how you move forward. And that has not happened. And I think the church underestimates how big of a deal that would be for not just black people, but for white people in the church as well to see, to hear like, oh no, we were wrong. And, and I feel when things change from the top down, this is for any issues. It's same with queer issues with the queer community. Then there's a baseline that everyone can go back to and can use to move forward. Because your ward can be great, but if I move somewhere else, my next ward can be really shitty. Sorry, I don't know if we can swear, but you know what I mean? And that's what I don't like. I have a great ward at home in Chicago, but anywhere else I move, it's bishop roulette, it's war roulette. You don't know where you're gonna be or what your experience is gonna be like because there's no institutional change and work towards equity for marginalized people. So that's my biggest take that the church needs to work on. I love it. That was really great. Thank you. That was a good answer. I'll take it. Um, last question, and then we can have fun. What is your advice to queer people who are listening to this, who perhaps could be closeted, contemplating whether or not they should attend BYU? Um, BYU has done a lot lately. They've created the BYU Office of Belonging. They've given a lot of lip service. <laughs> not us all doing the same noise at that, but go ahead. <laughs> given a, definitely given a lot of lip service to uh, marginalized communities um, in private, over pulpits, in public. What is your advice to those queer students, uh, potential BYU students, or even just queer Latter-day Saints who are venturing their way out of the closet a little bit and contemplating BYU, contemplating Mormonism, um, or even just marginalized communities, but specific. I, I really wanna mm -hmm. specifically uh, get your opinions and thoughts to the queer community. Is BYU a safe place? Um, is BYU making changes that could benefit the queer community um, short term and long term. Who wants to attack that? I have a, what? I think kind of like what I said earlier, I mean, I don't know if I would necessarily say like attend BYU. Um, I wouldn't, I would never want to put someone in an uncomfortable, unsafe position. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I already feel unsafe being black, but I, I'm straight. So like, I don't have to face that fight every day. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't say attend BYU. But I would say like what I said earlier, like if you're gonna be anything, be yourself because there are people who are going to love you and they're going to support you and eventually everyone's going to fall in line because that's what's right and it's being yourself and you are created perfectly and so nothing is wrong with you for being who you are and if you're coming out or if you are out or if you're fighting your loved ones or whatever there are people who love you and there are people who care about you i'm gonna cry because it makes me like hurt i think like like i said just be whoever you are and say it with your chest because that's exactly who you are supposed to be and there's nothing wrong with that. I think that, um, you know, there are a lot of good things about BYU. Um, I would say that most of them are not things that you wouldn't be able to find somewhere else. But I also think that, uh, you know, there, there can be a place for anyone who wants to come to the university, but uh, in order to survive there and to come out as whole as possible, um, there's a couple of things that you have to do. Um, you can't assimilate. I remember my freshman year, I tried to do that. I tried to to fit in with the general population, and you know, it, it took the took the form of self-deprecating humor. It took the form of, of um, you know, compromising parts of myself, my identity, in order to to be more palatable to other people, and uh, that took a heavy toll on me. So I would say that if someone is 
you know, I don't have much experience with this, but I would say that if someone is closeted and not in a place where they are are ready to to fully be themselves, then going to a place that would encourage them not to be themselves and encourage them to remain closeted, uh, it seems like that would be something that's dangerous. Now, if they if it's if they can come to BYU and be um, you know, be someone who is willing to be themselves and willing to find a community where they fit in and be a part of that community and be shameless um, in who they are, then I think that there's absolutely a place for them at BYU. But I think uh, it's there's so much pressure here to assimilate and to try and be like everyone else that it can be very dangerous if you don't learn uh, to to be who you are. It's good. Such good advice. We should have you on every week. <laughs> this would be like the best music and the spoken word that we could create from the Latter Day Stories podcast. Oh, that would be cool. Yeah. <laughs> Is there anything that we um, didn't tackle that you wanted to talk about? Um, any message that you want this community, the LGBTQ community, to know that we we didn't discuss, um, or to those out there who are just becoming familiar with the Black Menaces? Um, anything that you want to encourage them to lean into or lean away from? I think this is what I always say to everyone. I think we all have privileges in different ways, depending on the circles we're in and the circumstances we're put into. So um, you might be a part of a marginalized community in one instance and in another you're not. And I think just always being aware of that and trying to use your privilege for good is really important, right? I always tell people, um, you can always learn and we can always grow. And I think that that's really important for us to know, especially in spaces of more openness and liberal ideas and um, marginalized people that we still all can grow individually in lots of ways and no one, we all have blind spots and we all have ways in which we can improve. I do when it comes to issues with the queer community, right? Like I'm not, I'm, I'm an ally, I'm trying to learn, I'm trying to still grow issues with other ethnicities, I have things that I can learn and grow, and just being willing to hear people who don't have the same lived experience of, as you, and um, being able to acknowledge where you might have those blind spots is really important. Because um, I've encountered that in like liberal spaces at BYU, that, that feedback amongst marginalized communities is sometimes hard to take, but I think that's something that we all can do, is that we can all do better, and sometimes we make mistakes, even as we are trying to help and assist one another and that's okay, and that we can um, grow and change, and that's good. I think it's also important to acknowledge that we're all in this together, mm -hmm. right? Not to be high school musically, but um, <laughs> you know, we, we're still learning, right? I'm still learning for sure uh, mm -hmm. about the queer community and about other mm -hmm. marginalized communities. And as I'm learning, I, I'm learning to be a better advocate, a better ally, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'd, I, uh, you know, in some ways I'm trying to, to make that known. I have like a little straight ally patch that I found on Amazon that I just put on my backpack so that, you know, queer people on campus know, hey, that's someone who's an ally, right? There's someone who supports me because it can be difficult to go somewhere and not know if you have support. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we need to, all of us return that, you know, that support um, to every community that we go into. So as a black American, I have my own struggles, but I also want to be aware of the struggles of Native Americans, of mm -hmm. Latinx community, of the queer community, right? Of all these different communities, because we all, you know, like we're all, we all come together, right? There are black people who are queer. There are um, queer people who are Native American, mm -hmm. Latinx, like we all intersect. Um, and so I think we all need to learn to fight for each other. And as we fight for each other, as we come together in that way, I think we'll be able to be a lot more successful. I love it. And I think that's great advice. And that's exactly the mission of this podcast is to help people see that they're not alone, they're, they're not broken, and that they have great days ahead. That not just binding together and, fi and finding birds of a feather, but being united. And, and we could go into a whole separate podcast episode about the B1 and, oh. and the message that was shared there. Uh, but that's, that's the goal, right? The, the goal is the unity of faith and the, the unity of mankind and being able to, to coexist. Um, not just tolerate, but to accept and to, to yep. be, be one. And I, that really is the, the point of all of this. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I like that you've been able to harness that and, and be able to show that we can do better. Um, because when we add sunlight, that is one of the best disinfectants to some mm -hmm. of the problems that we have surrounding this topic. 
Um, where can those who are just learning about the Black Menaces find uh, find out more about you? Obviously, we've talked so much about TikTok and, and the socials, but you've got a clothing line. I just saw a new Pride line that you, you put <laughs> yes, out as well. For so, Pride Month. <laughs> for Pride Month coming up in June. So tell us a little bit, um, uh, tell our audience where they can find um, more of the Black Menaces, and then also uh, talk a little bit about your merch. Let's give you a plug here. Um, so we just redesigned our website. It's mm -hmm. um, I think it is a dot org. I'd have to double check, but I think it's just the black dot org. Um, it kind of has like a little bit about us, why we started, who we are. Um, our personal Instagrams are all public, so you can kind of dive into our lives if you wanted to, um, which is also all on our website, like everything is there. And then our merch, um, kind of like our purpose of be a menace, I guess, because we didn't really talk about that, is like mm -hmm. we are redefining what it means to be a menace because it has a negative connotation, but being a menace is someone who is, speaks out and stand up, stands up for what they believe in. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, we're called the black menaces because we're black, but <laughs> it's okay to be a menace and not be black. So um, kind of like what you're saying, like, so our shirt for Pride Month next month, we're releasing it early just so people have some time. But it's the same design, be a menace, but our menace is in rainbow just to kind of show our support if you're an ally or if you are a part of the community, just to kind of put it out there that you are someone who stands up for yourself, for others who are marginalized. Um, our pre-sale just ended, but we still have our shirts available. We also are coming out with some stickers. I just they designed last they night. Super so excited good. for that. The, the, the pride yes, stickers look so good. It is a minute. pride flag, and then it just says be a menace because, yeah, we support our LGBT community. Um, so those will be out soon yeah. tomorrow actually and so. part of our proceeds from the t-shirts that we're getting yes. for the pride month we are donating to a local organization in provo that helps um, the queer community and does a lot of really good work so 10 percent of our proceeds so whatever you guys the more you guys buy the more we can donate so that's our goal is to just make safe places and continue to support safe places for anyone and then we will have the black be a minister available after the pride month uh, shirts are done because we are still students who we are the ones doing these shipping yeah. and handling and we can't you know we're not a full-blown on yeah. t-shirt company so <laughs> yeah, we will have keep a, asking about them and i'm like pause like slow down this. i know i'm doing my best that's <laughs> yeah, what you're exactly. saying and so. we'll have a juneteenth shirt out yes. as well so kind of looking forward to that so pride month juneteenth, juneteenth a lot of things happen in june so we're kind of trying to stay ahead of the game but mm -hmm. everything will be out and we're doing our best to kind of reach all communities who want to support us so and we also have a patreon um Society. called men's society yeah. um because that's what we're going to call everyone who wants to be a menace is you're part of the menace society mm -hmm. and there we have extended video clips of other videos like maybe some questions we've asked that we haven't posted um, but also longer because some clips we cut down um, and so you can see longer versions of people's answers as well as um, in videos from the podcast that we are starting in june yeah <clears throat> super excited a lot of things coming yeah so. a lot of things coming because yeah thank you thank you to each of you for being vulnerable for sharing your experience for coming on the podcast and combining the uh, the discussion of marginalized communities mm -hmm. um with the uh with what you're doing at byu with what we're trying to do with the latter gay stories podcast thank you thank, thank you for, having for having leaning into that and helping us out with that um it's the black menaces, y'all. Um, yeah. <laughs> jump on board. Um, I, I remember someone uh, reached out to me and yeah, just said, hey, have you have you heard of the black menaces? And I said, what? What's going on? Uh, so I was I'm not I wasn't that behind the curve. Okay. But um, when I jumped on all my socials immediately jumped all over the menaces and I was super excited. And I love when something drops when yeah. there's something new. Um, because it it does just stir that pot just a little bit more to help bring more visibility and and help us to better understand the experiences of other people mm -hmm. and also see who we're dealing with um, because there's a there's a whole other culture out there that is counter to acceptance and understanding and love and and i think that's what uh, messages like what the menaces are out there doing um, really can benefit and help so thank mm -hmm. you yeah. thanks for having us <laughs> All right, y'all, it's the Black Menaces. Um, thank you. Thank you for giving us an hour of your time. Thank you for um, sharing this story. Um, 
and and really understanding what it's like to be marginalized at BYU and, and really understanding what it's like to tackle some of these really, really difficult uh, topics of discussion. So thank you for joining us for this hour. If you are watching on our video version, um, share your comments and thoughts and feelings uh, right now. We are interested in hearing what you have to say. And the menaces will follow us as well so they can answer some of your questions. I obligated them to do doing that without asking for their permission. So um, they can follow along in the chats as well and kind of answer your questions on our YouTube or Facebook channel. If you are listening on an audio version, we invite you to share this episode. You can simply and easily share these episodes uh, anywhere on social media uh, with your friends and family and circle. But uh, if you want to catch episodes like this ahead of time, be sure to subscribe to this channel wherever you catch your favorite audio podcasts, wherever you're listening on Google, uh, iTunes, iHeartMedia, Stitcher, or one of the others. We're everywhere you catch your favorite audio podcasts. We invite you to subscribe to this channel. You will, I promise, get these episodes just a little bit sooner if you do subscribe to the audio version. And uh, as always, the video versions are fun. So thank you for following along and thank you for participating. It's the Latter Gay Stories podcast, helping us build bigger and stronger bridges between the LDS and LGBTQ community, and most particularly in this episode, the marginalized communities as well. But it's, it's stories like yours and ours that help us each continue writing our own Latter Gay Story. <laughs>